The next bill we have on the agenda is House File 14. It's Representative Pinto's bill. Representative Pinto, would you like to move that House File 14 be re-referred to the Committee on Ju Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law? So moved, Madam Chair. All right, and would you also like to move the A5 amendment? Uh, you know, Madam Chair, maybe, um, maybe I should briefly explain the bill, and then I'll, I'm going to ask Mr. Diebel to walk us through the A5, but it might be useful to have just to understand how the bill works, and then that'll put the A5 in the context. <laughs> Okay, uh, great. And, Madam Chair. Yep, and I would just note too that you have your A5 amendment is the one that we're going to be adopting. There's a DE, and we're not going to be um, voting on the DE. It's really just here so that you can see what the bill looks like uh, as it would be amended with the A5. Is that correct, Representative Pinto? It is, Madam Chair. All right, go ahead and explain, uh, briefly explain your bill, and then we'll have Mr. Deeple walk through the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, the HF14 is a bill to require criminal background checks on un all gun sales. Um, and on um, all transfers, uh, gun transfers in Minnesota, with a number of exceptions uh, that we, we'll get into, I'm sure. Um, the bill is structured to um, require that when there is an unlicensed seller um, who's going to be uh, selling or transferring a gun to um, to a buyer, that that uh, there has to be a, uh, a permit to purchase uh, that is shown by the buyer to the seller. A permit to carry qualifies as a permit to purchase. Um, that permit to purchase is obtained uh, by going to law enforcement. Again, permit to carry uh, qualifies um, and then is shown and then um, records are kept by the seller and the buyer. Um, what the amendment does is, is uh, has a number of, of changes relating to that process, um, responding to concerns expressed from a number of quarters. And it may be uh, appropriate, Madam Chair, if it's okay, that I, I will at this time then move the A5 and would ask Mr. Diebel to, to walk the committee through it. Thank you. Mr. Diebel. Madam Chair and members, the A5 amendment, uh, I'm going to begin with the discussion of lines 1.2 to 1.6. This adds a grounds for a chief law enforcement officer to deny a transferee permit, and that grounds is a uh, name being on a criminal gang investigative data system, which is a exception or a grounds for denial of a permit to carry as well. Moving to lines 1.7 to 1.19 of the amendment, this mirrors language in the permit to carry statute, and it transfers it to the transferee permit statute, and it creates the standard for the permit to be denied based on an applicant's dangerousness. Moving to line 1.20 of the amendment, this extends the amount of time that a chief law enforcement officer has to process an application for a transfer permit to 30 days. Moving to line 1.21 through line 2.25, this language mirrors the appellate process as well as the due process rights granted to permit to carry applicants and it transfer extends those to those who apply for a transferee permit. Moving forward to line 2.26 of the A5 amendment, this begins the changes to the report of transfer statute. This also line extends the amount of time that a CLEO has or chief law enforcement officer has to process an application for a transfer report to 30 days. 2.27 through 2.31 modifies the process that a chief law enforcement officer has to shorten a waiting period, the 30-day waiting period that would be proposed in this bill. Moving to page 3 of the A5 amendment, lines 3.1 to 3.2, this is clarifying language that relates to the um, uh, transfer of a firearm from a licensed dealer to a uh, applicant for a firearm. Lines 3.33 to 3.7 of the, I'm sorry, 3.3 to 3.7 of the A5 amendment as the grounds for denying an applicant uh, for a transfer report based on their name being on the gang investigative data system. This is similar to what is done obviously uh, earlier in the, the amendment and then what is done currently in the Trans permit to carry statute. The next section, 3.8 to 3.21 of the amendment, 
This brings in the language from the, the permit to carry statute into the transfer report statute that provides guidance and standards for a chief law enforcement officer to deny an applicant based on their uh, determination that the person is a danger to self or the public. Lines 3.22 and 3.23 is a cross-reference to the new section that is proposed in the bill related to unlicensed firearms transfers, unlicensed owners of firearm transfers. 3.24 through 4.19 of the amendment. This is, again, language from the, that mirrors the, the permit to carry statute and extends the appellate and due process rights in that statute to those who are denied an application under the report of transfer statute. Four, moving to page four of the A5 amendment, 4.20 through 4.27. This defines the term unlicensed person and for the purposes of the new unlicensed party transfer statute in the bill. 4.28 through lines 5.32, insert a new subdivision into the new section in the statute which would allow unlicensed parties to bring their firearm to a licensed dealer to conduct the transaction as opposed to using the record of transfer process that's uh, proposed in the bill. That carries us through to page six, which all lines on this um, page six provide um, clarification that if you use this transfer process through a federal licensed dealer, that you are not obligated to comply with the record of transfer requirements that are proposed in the bill. Madam Chair, that concludes the overview of the A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Diebel. Representative Pinto. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I probably should have said at the outset, so there's really two general themes running in this. Hopefully this came clear as Mr. Diebel is describing the amendment. One is to have the permit to carry process, the standard that's applied for the review by law enforcement before issuing a permit, um, and the appellate process, the procedure, putting the burden on the government as opposed to the permit applicant, et cetera, having all that be paralleled uh, in this um, in the transferee permit application process, et cetera. And then the other piece is to add an optional path. If the unlicensed seller and buyer wish to, they can go to a federal firearms licensee, a licensed dealer, FFL, and have the dealer kind of complete the process. That way they don't have to worry about the paperwork, et cetera, and just go straight to a, to a dealer if they want to. Um, and that's simply an optional path. So those are sort of the two pieces. I know it's a fairly lengthy amendment, but really it's those two elements that are kind of what's going on here. Um, and I would ask for your support to, to get the bill in the shape that I wish, and then we can discuss the, the bill. Yep, discussion to the A5. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails, the A5 amendment is adopted. All right, Representative um, Pinto would normally have you tell us about your bill, but you did that already, so I think we're ready to move on to the testifiers. Just fine, Madam Chair. Um, members and testifiers, so this, uh, for this portion, we're going to have 15 minutes for the proponents and then 15 minutes for the opponents, and again, the public testifiers that signed up in advance will each have 90 seconds. Um, the public testifiers that are here, will, the first one is Commissioner Bob Jacobson. Come on forward. Chief Booker Hodges is second, so if you can come up as well. Um, and then the next person on deck will be Michelle Zender Fisher, so we can just keep things moving along. Welcome back to the committee, Commissioner. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chair Moeller, I'm Bob Jacobson. For the record, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, honored to be here today. I am here to support Representative Pinto's House File 14, which will require criminal background checks on all private transfers and sales of firearms. While I am new to the Department of Public Safety, I know that uh, Walt's administration has been pushing for this change for over four years now. Requiring criminal background checks on transfers of firearms is a common sense law. It should not matter whether you purchase a firearm at a local retailer or a private seller, you should be required to pass a background check. In fact, 21 other states have adopted similar laws to accomplish this very same goal. 
Currently in Minnesota, to purchase any firearm at a federally licensed firearms dealer, the buyer must pass a criminal background check. This bill will help ensure that all gun purchases and transfers are treated in a consistent manner. And I want to be clear, this bill will not stop every criminal from acquiring a firearm, but I do believe that passing this legislation will reduce gun violence and save families from the devastating impact of losing a loved one. We will still need strong prevention, intervention, mental health resources to those in need and enforcement to reduce gun violence in our state. The key to our success is working together and using multiple tools to reduce deaths and injuries due to gun violence. Local law enforcement and other community groups are, are critical partners in that work. The Police Executive Research Forum put out a publication in reducing gun violence. One of the nine recommendations they had was to keep guns out of the hands of people who are legally prohibited from owning them. In order to do so, this effectively, we must pass this bill to ensure background checks are also required on private sales and transfers. The report also points out that the National Instant Criminal Background Check System has prevented more than 1.5 million illegal firearm sales since 1998. This includes those who have committed serious crimes, fugitives, domestic violence convictions, or protection restraining orders for domestic violence. This proposal has the ability to reduce gun violence and in turn reduce the number of victims of violent crimes that our state serves. The impact of gun violence impacts families, children, health care, education, employment, and our society as a whole. This is a great action step in us <coughs> working together. And as a new commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, I commonly think about how best to serve the mission of the agency, which is serving all communities to build a safer Minnesota. I think this proposal helps us do that. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, next testifier, we have Chief Booker Hodges, and then Michelle Zender Fisher, if you want to come on up to the testifier table. Welcome to the committee, Chief. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Yep, uh, Chair Moeller, my name is Booker Hodges. I'm the police chief for the city of Bloomington. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, an association that represents more than 300 chiefs across the state and 200 uh, members of command staff. And we are just here to personally testify in support of this uh, bill, House File 14. The Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association has long been committed to keeping our residents and law enforcement officers safe and from the threat of gun violence. Our association supports preventing individuals who are legally able to purchase a gun from doing so without background checks. Um, at gun shows, uh, online, or in private transactions. Uh, thank you, Representative Pinto, and on your continued support and hard work, important work on this public safety issue that will have a dramatic uh, impact on our state and the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association uh, urges members to support this bill. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you for your testimony. Um, on deck, we have Sheriff Camrude, who's a remote. So then the next testifier in person after Ms. Sender Fisher will be Dr. Will Nicholson. So Dr. Nicholson, if you want to make your way to the table. And um, Michelle Zender Fisher, welcome. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Michelle Zender Fisher. I'm the Nicollet County Attorney and here today as president of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Uh, I'm here today to recommend support of this bill. The legislation strikes an appropriate balance uh, between protecting uh, public safety in all mechanisms of firearm transfers while still ensuring the constitutional right to possess firearms. It closes the existing gap that currently exists uh, that allows for the transfer of firearms without appropriate background checks, which represents a uh, risk to public safety. Minnesota County Attorneys Association therefore supports this bill as an important advancement um, to protecting public safety. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Jason Camridge, uh, Sheriff, you are online. I see you, we see you. Please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and begin your testimony. Good morning, I'm Carver County Sheriff Jason Camrood and I am here today to speak uh, in support of House File 14 on behalf of Minnesota Sheriff's Association representing 87 county sheriffs. Uh, 30 years ago when I was getting into law enforcement, the landscape surrounding the purchase, possession, and use of firearms was considerably different than it is today. And the increase in mental health crises and increases in, in gun violence, both self-inflicted and, and uh, criminal acts, 
uh, requires a new look. Uh, I suspect we agree we need to uh, work to, toward preventing uh, mentally ill or dangerous people from accessing firearms and, and granting your elected sheriffs and chiefs of police the ability to deny or revoke permits to transfer for those who, uh, based on documented evidence, pose a threat to themselves or others, will help prevent dangerous people from accessing certain types of firearms while maintaining the rights of responsible gun owners. Uh, we appreciate the author's work in ensuring the proposed legislation provides that limited discretion to the CLEOs. Uh, one recommendation we respectfully ask you to consider relates to retention of transfer paperwork. Uh, in our view, asking a private party to tr retain transfer paperwork for 20 years seems a bit excessive. Uh, we will continue to work with the author to present viable alternatives. Uh, lastly, and most importantly, I want to thank you all for your time and for your willingness to consider the input from uh, your county sheriffs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, before Dr. Nicholson testifies, we have Joyce Hayden and Mike Myers. If you can make your way to the table as well. Um, Dr. Will Nicholson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, and good morning, Madam Chair and members of this committee. Uh, my name is Will Nicholson. I'm a family doctor and a hospitalist in St. Paul. And I'm the president of the Minnesota Medical Association. I'm testifying here on behalf of the MMA and the more than 10,000 physicians and physicians in training that we have as members who are in strong support of HF14. The reason that 10,000 physicians and physicians in training are in strong support is because firearm death and in injury is an epidemic. Let's talk about the facts. This is an epidemic that is particularly acute among children and adolescents, as well as young adults. Every day, 22 children are victims of firearm death and injury in the United States. According to the CDC, firearms recently became the number one cause of death for children in our country. This surpasses motor vehicles and deaths from all other injuries. This is appalling, and we must do better for our children. In addition, we continue to see that firearm violence is disproportionately and overwhelmingly impacting our communities of color, with black Americans experiencing 10 times the firearm homicides and 18 times the firearm injuries of the rest of the population. Simply put, background checks work. In Minnesota, 891 and 44 background checks were conducted in 2022 based on the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System. While this system has been successful in preventing tens of thousands of firearm sales to individuals prohibited from purchasing guns, an enormous loophole exists. A 2015 report published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a widely respected medical journal, found that 22%, almost one in four, gun purchases over the course of the previous two years were not subject to background checks. Furthermore, 45% of gun owners who acquired a gun online in the past two years did so without any background check being conducted. This glaring loophole must be closed. Now, I'm confident that opponents of this legislation will tell you that expanded background checks won't prevent all firearm death and injuries, and they're right. There is no guarantee this legislation will prevent all deaths, all injuries, but just because something won't fix everything doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. A few years ago, a gun right organization scolded the nation's physicians for advocacy on behalf of firearm safety measures, urging us to, quote, stay in our lane, end quote. Members, this is very much our lane. Not only do physicians do the work to repair the damage to tissues and organs and lives following gunshot wounds, we are often the people who personally tell the families of the victims that their son or mother or grandfather has died as a result. When more than 45,000 Americans die as a result of firearm violence, 4,357 of whom are children, there is no other way to describe this. It is a public health crisis and we are in this fight. On behalf of Minnesota's physicians, I urge you to support smart, common sense measures like HF14. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, up next, we have Joyce Hayden. Come on over to the table. And then Mike Myers will be the final testifier at this point. We have about six minutes left. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, 
My name is Joyce Hayden, and I am here as a survivor. My daughter, Taylor Hayden, was taken from us July 23rd, 2016. Today is difficult. It's hard, and we shouldn't have to be here. We shouldn't have to be telling our stories. We've heard way too many at this point. This week is National Gun Violence Survivors Week, a time when we as survivors come together to share and amplify the stories and the voices of gun violence survivors like myself. We live with this impact on a daily basis, day by day, hour by hour. This week, the first week of February, marks the week of uh, survivors being able to tell our stories. It's a difficult week for me because this week leads into Taylor's birthday. Her birthday is February 23rd, and so it just becomes a month where we're having to relive this over and over and over again. The pain is amplified every day, and it doesn't get easier. This happened in 2016, and so this we're in 2023. This is not an easy task for me. I just said to my stepson, Jeff Hayden, that I suddenly have a headache. I shouldn't have a headache. I shouldn't be feeling this trauma, but I do. Um, and I've told Taylor's story a number of times. And, 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 and I'll tell it again and again and again until we get it in our heads that we can do something to stop this. We can do something to end gun violence. We don't have to live with this trauma. We don't have to be subject to it. It's within our grasp. It's within our hands. We can do it. We can make the change. We have the ability to do that. And so I appeal to you today to make the necessary changes that we need to end gun violence. Having a bill that, that really causes people to have a license, to have a background check, is important. It's very important. And we don't say that for people who are getting their guns legally. We say that for all the guns that are on the street that are illegal, all the guns that are stolen. Those are the ones that we want to make sure that we stop. I wear this color today because it represents Taylor. This was her color. And um, I don't know how she came up with it, but even as a little girl, she wanted her room this color. She wanted every notebook this color. Everything that she had was in this color. So I wear this to represent her. I wear this to have you see her through me. It's important that we understand that we are dealing with lives and we don't want to risk losing anymore. So I veered pretty much off my my speech, but I think it was necessary that I be more authentic and transparent so that you clearly get where I'm coming from and what I am asking you to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Mike Myers, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mike Myers, and I'm a member of Gabby Gifford's Gun Owners for Safety. I'm the co-leader of the Minnesota chapter. Gifford supports the Second Amendment, but thinks reasonable gun laws for safety is a paramount. I'm a hunter, a collector, a reloader, a veteran of the United States Navy, where I served as a gunner's mate, and a concealed carry permit holder. Firearms are a part of my life. I'm here today to testify in support of HF 14 that would require all gun purchases in Minnesota to be subject to background checks. Background checks are the most important tool we have to enforce the laws already on the books. Background checks are popular with nearly all Americans, including gun owners like me. I have undergone a background check for every firearm I've purchased in this state, and I consider it my responsibility as a gun owner to do so. You'll likely hear people testify today that background checks won't stop criminals from getting guns and only burden law-abiding gun owners or that transfers between unlicensed sellers are usually to people they know so we don't need background checks on private sales. Usually is not good enough. As a gun owner, 
We should work on laws to filter the process and keep firearms out of the hands of people who have them. And a filter doesn't work if you ignore the big holes in it. Sadly, there's more paperwork involved in a funeral than there is in a gun purchase. As a gun owner and a Minnesotan who wants to set an example of responsible gun ownership, I strongly urge you to pass HF 14 out of committee. It does not infringe on my rights and is a critical step towards reducing gun violence in this state. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony <clears throat> and for all the testifiers. Next up, we have the testimony in opposition. Um, I believe all those testifiers are present. Reverend Tim Christopher, Sarah Hauptman, and Brian Strasser, if you can make your way up to the testifier table. I'll give you a minute to get up here. Reverend Christopher, you are up next, so please welcome to the committee. Come introduce yourself, and you can begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for having me and in the committee. How are we doing, Cedric, Walter? How are we doing? I've been listening to a lot of things that, that's been going on. I've been listening to a lot of things that, that, that is happening here with this here bill. And I think um, Mr. Punto know who I am and I know who he is. Um, and, I, and I just listened to the guy from Gabby Gifford sit up here and say the things that he says said. Um, Gabby Gifford came into Minneapolis a couple years ago and got a group of white men together right outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, talking about black uh, violence in, in the community and did not invite not one black man to that. What you need to understand is some of these bills that are being put forth, they're racist and we know that because they don't, they don't go far enough to help the black community. I was in church this Sunday when LaDamian Garrett Jr. And some of y'all don't even know who that kid is. LaDamian is the third kid who survived the shooting this summer. Uh, the other three, the other two died, correct, Ted? I guarantee you those kids that were shot was shot by someone who was a gun, who, who shouldn't have been owning a gun. And was should have been prosecuted for having that gun. But because we're so light on crime, that person got out. I guarantee you, that's, that's what happened. These, this here bill that you're about to put here, I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm against it. Cool. My point is, it does nothing for the black community. Nothing at all. All these bills you're gonna be putting up, it does nothing for the black community. I can, I can shoot them down real quick, because what happens is that they go down to Texas, to Alabama, they go get guns, they bring them back up, they sneak them into North Minneapolis. Nobody needs a bad gown check. We know that, right? No, I'm just saying, we know that. that, that happens. So why don't you start prosecuting the gun laws? Use the laws that are on the books to save some of these black lives. Do you, do, do anybody know how many black kids were shot under 18 this year? Anybody? That's what I'm saying, people. Y'all don't come down there. Paul Novotny is the only one that's came down to help me out. We stood, right, Paul? We stood in a, uh, the liquor store, and we thought we was going to have to shoot ourselves out. Am I correct? The only one. The rest of y'all, I ain't seen y'all down there. I ain't seen you do nothing. I sat in front of you a couple of years ago, and I said, somebody give a damn. And all these babies died because y'all didn't give a damn. But I'm supposed to sit here today and, and act like I care about these bills. It's not going to do anything for the black community. Not one of those bills are going to do something for the black community. Moms and Man Protect Minnesota comes into the black community and act like they care. They don't give a damn. They ain't been back there since they got the numbers to come up here and pay y'all bill to get you to vote for this stuff. You know that, man. Come on, people. I've got to talk for my people. If y'all going to be talking for yours, I'll talk for mine. Period. Thank you. Thank you. The next testifier is Sarah Hopman, and on deck is Brian Strasser. 
Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is Sarah Houtman. I'm from Maplewood, Minnesota. I'm a volunteer for the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Riddle me this. What exactly does contact with law enforcement mean? It's not defined in the bill, but I can tell you what I've seen. Maybe your neighbors think you're making too much noise or they don't like the way you put out your trash. Maybe you drive a busted car. Maybe you are walking while black in a diner. Maybe the officer just didn't like your tone. Maybe you got uppity and went to a protest against police brutality. And maybe you got kettled under a bridge and arrested. Contact with law enforcement. The way HF 14 is written, any encounter could be a pretext for denying your constitutionally protected Second Amendment rights. We're not talking about being convicted of a crime in court. We're talking about broad officer discretion with no due process. If these examples seem ridiculous to you, that's because they are. You're right. And ask yourself why you would support a bill that allows ridiculous things to happen. I will say this. I do believe that most people who support gun control genuinely desire to protect citizens from each other. And that's a noble intent. That's important. But we also have a duty and an obligation to protect citizens from the government. Remember that just two years ago, we were talking about defunding the police because they couldn't be trusted. And now today, we're forcing members of marginalized communities to go to the police and beg for permission to exercise their fundamental civil rights. This bill gives police unlimited power and zero incentive to act right. If you are black in Minnesota, you are nine times more likely to be arrested for disorderly conduct five times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, 25 times more likely to be arrested for loitering, nine times more likely to be stopped for a broken taillight, 29 times more likely to be searched during a traffic stop. Contact with law enforcement. I don't know what was in the hearts of legislators when they signed onto this bill, but I do know what officer discretion is code for. Thank you. All right, uh, Brian Strasser, welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Brian Strasser, Chairman for the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of our members and supporters in opposition to Representative Pinto's Bill HF 14. This legislation places an undue barrier in front of law-abiding gun owners by requiring a state-issued license in order to obtain a firearm and does not do anything to stop the flow of firearms in the criminal illicit gun market that operates in the state. It takes the waiting process from seven days to 30, further delaying the exercise of a core part of that right, the ability to purchase a firearm for self-defense. And as Sarah said, it invests entirely too much power in law enforcement. It gives them the ability to decide who and who does not get to exercise their constitutional right. Unlike our permit to carry law, as amended, this bill, if you're wrongfully denied by a law enforcement off, uh, the law enforcement chief and you prevail on appeal in court, there's no provision to get your legal or court costs covered by the law enforcement leader that wrongfully denied you. This bill creates a paperwork trail with law enforcement, firearms dealers, and private citizens that amounts to a de facto registry of firearms and their owners that can be accessed by any law enforcement officer without a warrant or without a subpoena or any form of court order. The form that gun owners will be required to keep for 20 years contains the make and model of the firearm and the serial number of the firearm, none of which is necessary to record for a background check. Why is that any of the government's business? And guess what? If you can't produce this when the police officer knocks on your door at 3 a.m. and demands you to produce it, you get to get charged with a gross misdemeanor and go to jail. And that can happen 19 years, 364 days after the transaction. This bill creates a financial burden in front of exercising one's specific enumerated constitutional right to possess a firearm. You have to get a permit to purchase. That takes time. By the way, only during the business week during business hours. Or a permit to carry. That's time plus costs. 
If you don't want to do the paperwork process, you got to go to a dealer. If you're in Minneapolis or St. Paul, too bad. No dealers because the city has zoned them out of existence. You get to pay the dealer for the transfer. $20, $50, $100 is not uncommon. And if you're transferring this for someone for hunting purposes for a long hunting trip, you get the privilege of doing this twice on both ends of the equation. Data from the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Statistics show that 8% of criminals are obtaining their firearms through private sales. They're not getting these from law-abiding gun owners. A 19-year study out of California by folks on the other end of this issue from us um, at the University of California, Davis, looking at two decades of data since California passed the same law, that that law had absolutely no impact on homicide or suicide rates with firearms in California. 79% of our firearm deaths here are suicides. Most of these are men in greater Minnesota, 45 to 64 years old. There's no evidence that shows these individuals are prohibited persons that are gonna be stopped through this form of a background check. These individuals are almost certainly using firearms they have owned for years. Earlier, the Nicollet County attorney uh, testified on this bill that it strikes the right balance between constitutional rights and public safety. But that's not the standard for how we evaluate burdening the Second Amendment anymore. In the Supreme Court's Bruin case, that standard is text, history, and tradition from 1791, not balancing of, that, of, of rights. Criminals in Minnesota today obtain their firearms for their crimes by theft, that's a state and federal crime. Straw purchases, a state and federal crime. They get it through an illegal transaction on the illicit market between individuals that are also committing a crime, state and federal. When two individuals meet for an illicit firearm transaction behind the Cub Food up the road from my house in Arden Hills, they're already committing multiple felonies in state and federal law. If this bill becomes law, it's not gonna stop theft, it's not gonna stop straw purchases, and it's not gonna stop the trunk loads of guns that Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry says are coming into Minneapolis. We should vote this bill down, and the body should instead pursue laws that punish criminals that are engaged in the illicit gun market and ensure that courts are properly sentencing prohibited persons arrested in possession of a firearm or ammunition in violation of current law and the criminal market and the individuals running it that provides those firearms. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks to all three of you very much for your testimony today. We will move on to public testifiers and we have Kathleen Anderson, Thomas Gallagher, and Ben Dorr on our list. So if the three of you wanna go ahead and make your way to the testifier table, um, you will have a minute and a half each. We'll give you a chance to uh, get here. I think uh, Kathleen Anderson, you're up first. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Moeller, Rep Pinto, committee members and staff. My name is Kathleen Anderson, and I'm a mom. I'm, here to, I'm also a social worker, and I'm here to represent thousands of Moms Demand Action supporters from across the state in support of House File 14. House File 14 is critical legislation to extend Minnesota's criminal background check law to cover all handgun and semi-automatic assault weapon sales. Background check laws are the foundation and backbone of any gun violence prevention strategy. When there is no required background check on guns sold by unlicensed gun dealers, a loophole exists. This loophole makes it easier for people with violent felony convictions, domestic abuse convictions, and or restraining orders, or prohibitive histories of serious mental illness to buy guns with no questions asked. Requiring background checks on all gun sales is proven to reduce gun violence. Our research shows us that state laws requiring background checks for all gun sales are in fact associated with lower firearm homicide rates, lower firearm suicide rates, and reduced firearm trafficking. We know that states that require background checks for all gun sales have homicide rates 10% lower than states without them. We know that we're facing an escalating gun violence crisis right here in Minnesota. The rate of gun homicides has increased 113% from 2011 to 2020. Gun violence is a plague that kills so many of our children and is making our, our survivor community grow every hour of every day. I urge you to take comprehensive action to fight gun violence in our state and vote yes on House File 14. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thomas Gallagher, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Thomas Gallagher, G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R. I'm a criminal defense attorney 
in Minneapolis going on my 35th year doing that work. I have represented many people over many years and many of them have been African American. And what I have noticed is that um, prohibition type crimes tend to be enforced against African Americans far more than anybody else. And I think that's wrong. I brought along uh, my copy of The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander to kind of illustrate that point. There's large quantity of research in here talking about that. The, all of these bills today, including HL 14, but all, all four of them, um, create criminal penalties that do not previously exist, and they expand criminal liability where it did not previously exist. Uh, these prohibition-type crimes, like marijuana and nonviolent gun crimes, um, have a higher, I believe, that there's a more use of discretion on the part of law enforcement officers and prosecutors and other people in the criminal system um, that in the, in, even though there's no intention to be racist, the effect is racist. These are racist laws, and these are being unequally applied, and I can't believe that we are talking about doing more of that. We have an over-criminalization problem in the United States and in Minnesota. We have too many criminal laws. We have uh, a mass incarceration problem, as Michelle Alexander talks about in her book. We need to stop, and we need to stop now. We all, most of us probably agree on these general principles, but we need to get down to specifics. These bills are the specifics. We need to defeat these bills. Please vote no on all of them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ben Dorr, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, I'm Ben Dorr. I'm the Executive Director for Minnesota Gun Rights. I've got 90 seconds to make an hour-long point, so I'll just get right to it. I'm here to today to tell you that the people of Minnesota are sick and tired of having their rights and freedoms stomped on by petty tyrants. We're sick and tired of inner-city criminals being let off the hook by Democrat prosecutors who have no desire at all to stop crime, but rather to tread on everyday gun owners. We will not be tread upon, and there will be no compromise. This whole hearing, in our opinion, is a goat roping joke. So we'll just say this. Minnesota gun rights is massive, and our reach extends deep into every district in Minnesota that matters. If you pass these bills, Minnesota gun rights will viciously expose every politician in the weakest districts in Minnesota in the 2024 elections and every election beyond. And we're well situated for it. More than that, we will encourage mass peaceful non-compliance with any of these tyrannical and unconstitutional laws if they should become law. You can't have our guns. You can't take our Second Amendment away. And we will not comply because we know that what's happening here is the attempted disarmament of your political opposition. The choice comes down to the most vulnerable members of your caucus. Good luck. Vote no. Thanks for your testimony. Members, that is all we have for the testifiers. We are gonna move on to member discussion, but I believe we have a couple of amendments first. Um, first, we have the A2 amendment. Who will be offering the A2 amendment? Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair Moeller. The A2 amendment simply strikes on page 10, line 17. We're deleting the 20-year requirement for records and at least bringing it into something that's reasonable. You're only required to keep your tax records for seven years. Um, if we're going to force these transfers, at least make it a reasonable period of time. 20 years is a long time. Um, if something's going to happen with that firearm that um, already would be illegal anyway, no matter what we do with these laws, at least uh, let's, let's keep it reasonable in what that transfer and you know, not make someone uh, responsible for something that happened two years or 20 uh, Two decades mm -hmm. beforehand. Are we we'll go roll call, Chair. I'm sorry. What was the last part you said? Requesting a roll call. Roll call was requested. All right, Representative Pinto, to the to this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Navadi, I, I understand the concern. Uh, the reason for the time period in the bill is because, um, really, if you're 
selling a gun, you're in the same position as a dealer is the idea, and that's the same length of time that dealers are required to keep records. Um, having heard the concern, though, that was the reason for adding in that amendment that we adopted, um, the optional path that if the seller does not want to have to keep the records and buyer doesn't want to keep the records, then what they can do is go to an FFL. The vast majority of Minnesotans are a short, um, a short trip away uh, from an FFL, uh, and then you can complete the transfer there. So that's an option, but um, but the idea is that if we've decided as a society that those who are selling guns should be keeping the records for that longer period of time, the idea is that you're taking on that responsibility as well, um, similarly to the dealer, and so that's the reason that I would ask folks to oppose the amendment. Thanks. All right, further discussion on the A2 amendment? <clears throat> Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair Muller. Um, the reasonable charge isn't specified. Uh, having transferred firearms myself, it, it can be uh, time consuming and costly to do. Um, just seems, it's just common sense request, a uh, request to Green vote. A roll call has been requested on the A2 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Moeller? No. Moeller, no. Vice Chair Feist? No. Feist, no. Representative Novotny? Yes. Novotny, yes. Representative Becker-Finn? No. Becker-Finn, no. Representative Curran? No. Curran, no. Representative Ingen? Yes. Ingen, yes. Representative Fraser? No. Fraser, no. Representative Grussell? Yes. Grussell, yes. Representative Hollins? No. <clears throat> Hollins, no. Representative Hudson? Yes. Hudson, yes. Representative Hewitt? No. Hewitt, no. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Mueller, yes. Representative Pinto? No. Pinto, no. Representative Tapke? No. Tapke, no. Representative Witte? Yes. Witte, yes. There being six ayes and nine nays, that concludes the roll call vote. There being six ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail. The A2 amendment is not adopted. The next amendment we have is the A3 amendment. Who will be offering that amendment? Representative Hudson to the A3. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm pleased to see that at the very least, there's an acknowledgement um, of not trying to impede transfers between family members. Uh, it's stated in lines 11, 9 through 11, 11, uh, and defined as immediate family members. What my amendment would do is expand that just a little bit to include the following definition for family member. A spouse, including a domestic partner in a civil union or other registered domestic partnership as recognized by the state, and a spouse's parent, a child and a child's spouse, a parent and a parent's spouse, a sibling and a sibling spouse, a grandparent, grandchild, or spouse of a grandparent and grandchild, a child of a sibling, a sibling of the parents, a child-in-law, parent-in-law, sibling-in-law, and grandparent-in-law, and any other individual who is related by blood or affinity and whose association is equivalent of a family relationship. And this language um, is lifted straight from House File 2, which is the paid family leave bill. So. It, it has precedent as being regarded as a family member um, in a bill authored by the majority. So I would ask for acceptance of this amendment. All right, Representative Pinto to this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hudson. Um, I appreciate the chance through this amendment just to highlight for members and members of the public the quite extensive exclusions from the bill, which are on nearly two full legal size um, pages on the back of the bill. Um, but uh, but I would ask uh, members to, to uh, vote against the amendment. I understand the, the goal, um, but have the concern that um, as you start getting out an extended family, and, and certainly then to folks who whose association is equivalent of a family relationship, um, uh, you know, I don't necessarily know the exact criminal backgrounds of, of some extended family members. And the idea here is to say that at some point, um, there needs to be, we need to be having a, a background check. Um, uh, and it does seem to me that in looking at this uh, list, um, this goes beyond what would be reasonable for that. So I would uh, urge the members vote against. Further discussion on the A3 amendment? Representative becker -Finn. Uh, thank you, Chair Muller. And I did want to point out that already in the bill, um, we've got 
the exclusion, as was just noted by Representative Pinto, uh, transfer between immediate family members, which means spouses, domestic partners, parents, children, siblings, grandparents, and grandchildren. So that's already actually excluded in the bill. Um, I'm also not sure of what we mean by affinity um, and uh, wondering if, um, if Representative Hudson would speak to what the intent is with affinity, you know, is um, if I'm in a club with somebody, is that what we mean? Do we mean, um, are my friends in my group text close enough? Um, are sorority sisters close enough? What, what do we mean by affinity? Because I think that could be interpreted pretty broadly um, depending upon what we mean by that. And it's not laid out um, or defined in the amendment. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative becker Fenn. You might want to ask the majority leader of your caucus because that language comes from his bill, House File 2. I don't know. So if the problem needs to be solved, consult with your majority leader. Representative becker Finn. Um, House File 2 is carried by uh, Representative Richardson, not the majority leader. Um, and I think uh, <laughs> referring to other bills, that isn't actually how this works. Um, we have to define things if we're going to define things. And that didn't really answer the question of what the intent is. We are setting the legislative intent of what is meant. And I think that this... Um, I, you know, I think it highlights that we don't we don't have an answer. There's no answer. It could mean whatever you want it to mean, and I think that's much too broad um, and doesn't actually uh, keep our communities safe, which is the intention of this bill. So, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'll, ha I'll let you have closing comments on your amendment. Any further discussion on the A3 amendment? Yeah, uh, Representative Nabani. Thank you, Chair Moeller. Representative becker Finn. Um, that's almost the exact language that was used in a bill that I believe you were involved in in the uh, Native American uh, adoption and the, the step, the foster care programs. It's almost, still, almost the same language that was used in the African American uh, adoption and step programs, things that we've gone through expanding what a family is. So that's why we thought that language would be appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Final word, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, without this amendment, then I would have had to have gotten a background check to accept a firearm from my father-in-law. And that's absurd. Um, the idea that we can't with confidence. I mean, so you want, a, you want a definition, you want legislative intent for related by blood or affinity. We're talking about people who are regarded as family. I don't regard people as family whose background I don't know. So if indeed the rationale, the justification for having an exemption and exclusion, which allows people to transfer between their immediate family members is that there is intimate knowledge amongst family that precludes the need for a background check, then I think we can trust Minnesotans. We've heard that frequently through this session, right? We need to trust Minnesotans in various areas. Well, let's trust them then. We can trust Minnesotans to define family for themselves and to regard those who they consider family to be safe to transfer a gun to. Thank you. Oh, yes. All right. All those in favor of the A3 am amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion does not prevail and the A3 amendment is not adopted. All right, that is the final amendment, I think, members. And now we're going to move on to the bill discussion. Um, Representative Hollins. Uh, thank you, Chair Moeller, and, and thank you, Representative Pinto, for bringing this. Uh, may I ask Representative Pinto just a quick question? Yeah. I just wanted to confirm that the contact with law enforcement aspect of the bill was removed with that large <laughs> amendment that we had at the beginning, correct? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and Representative Hollins, thanks for the chance to bring that up. Yes, so that was, that was in the original bill language. It is no longer now that we've amended it. That's exactly right. Not in there. Thank you. I really appreciate Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Representative Hollins. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I do have a lot of concerns around that because we do know that black and brown communities are over police and are more frequently in contact with law enforcement. So that is something that would be a, a distinct concern for me. Um, 
I, I feel like I have to disclose, I am also a lawful gun owner. Um, I have been shooting since I was about nine years old with my dad, who is from Alabama, so he loves his guns. Um, and if you think that, you know, folks, especially black people, would like to have firearms now, imagine yourself as a black man in Jim Crow South. Mm. Like, this is especially important to him, and his lawful gun ownership is especially important to him, and that's how I was raised. Um, you know, I wanted to address the Reverend's concerns because I have not been to North Minneapolis to do work on this, but that's because I represent the east side of St. Paul where gun violence is also a problem. And I am on the east side of St. Paul working to try and end gun violence that has become a plague in our community. This is a statewide issue. And um, I think that I'm really here because my community has asked me to be here, because we know that a lot of the gun violence that is proliferated in St. Paul, and especially on the east side, is done by people who are not lawful gun owners, people who have had these transfers happen without proper background checks, individuals who are gang members or former felons. And this is something that I think is very, very reasonable. We don't allow people to drive a car without having some sort of testing happening. And we're giving people, we're allowing folks to just transfer deadly weapons without any sort of background check. That's just not acceptable to me. So I am very excited to vote yes on this bill. And I, with that, I would request a roll call. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill. Representative Witte. Uh, thank you, Chair Muller. Um, and uh, thank you, Representative Hollins, for those comments. Uh, I'm a former law enforcement officer. One of my uh, duties was to run a street crimes unit. And one of the things we were uh, tasked to do was to get the illegal guns off the streets. We would arrest somebody, and they would be out the next day. We got laws that could keep them in and not get the guns. Reverend Tim Christopher, you uh, moved me. And uh, if there's ever an opportunity that I can come with uh, um, Representative Novotny and help you, I, do, I would love to take that opportunity with you because I think we can do more. Um, I always say this, that um, it starts at the family, but it takes a village to raise our kids. So anything I can do, please uh, look me up. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate all the comments that have been said here today. I, I especially want to say I appreciate the passion that the Reverend came up with today. Uh, we sat down a few months ago and talked, and um, I've been in North Minneapolis a lot. I used to live in North Minneapolis uh, for a few years, um, very much associated with the community. Uh, it, it's a place that reminds me of the home I grew up in, in Chicago, my neighborhood, uh, Inglewood. We, I, I agree, one of the reasons that I ran for office is because I didn't believe that we were doing enough at this level to help deal with some of the issues in communities like North Minneapolis. Uh, but it's not just North Minneapolis, there's communities around the state that are dealing with the issues um, that are being, that are uh, the, the plague of gun violence. It's happening around our state, not just North Minneapolis. I hear a lot of talk about Minneapolis whenever we have these conversations, but it's not unique to North Minneapolis. It's a tragedy that is so overrepresented in North Minneapolis, but it's not unique to North Minneapolis. Uh, I did, and we, this committee, passed House File 25 out of here unanimously, one of the first bills that we moved out unanimously. In that bill, there's $150 million to deal with prevention and intervention. But Mula smile on me because some of that money is going to go to her community to help deal with some of these issues. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not just North Minneapolis. Reverend, some of that money is going to go to your church to help with some of the programs you run for intervention and prevention. I see some other folks in the audience. Their programs, they deal with victims. It's going to help them deal with victims and advocate for victims on these issues. We're trying to do some of this work. But what I'll say is before uh, DFL had a trifecta, I brought some of these same bills, and they were stalled or not even heard on the Senate side by my Republican colleagues. There's a lot of work that we need to do. This is some of the work that we need to do. There's no panacea, but this is some of the work that we need to do. So I'm going to be happy to support these bills, but it's far from 
everything that we need to do. And we do have racism in this system. We absolutely do. But the reason we involve law enforcement in these issues is because they are trained to do these things. And I'd rather put someone that's trained in the situation to handle it than someone that's not trained in that situation to handle it. So I'm looking forward to moving these bills forward and continue to have this conversation. Representative Grossel. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, more often than not, I find myself uh, in agreement with our MPPOA Sheriffs and Chiefs Association, but not today. Not today, and I'm sorry to say that. I'm sorry I have to say that. I'm sorry that they've allowed themselves to be uh, politically manipulated. Politically ma manipulated for just a uh, political special interest. I am really sorry to say that. That it's, uh, I, I take a step back and I will continue to work with our folks in public safety and uh, sheriffs and chiefs of police, but you better take a look around you folks and remember who you serve. It's the citizens of this state that you serve. And I have to ask the uh, author, Representative Pinto, how many criminals will this bill stop? Representative Pinto. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Grossel, as a number of test fires said, we know this is not going to prevent um, uh, every transfer of an illegal gun. But what we do know is that this um, is an expectation that we have of gun owners. And this is something that responsible gun owners, I think, will do. Um, already do, I would hope you, Representative Grasso, would not give a gun to somebody without knowing their criminal background. And this is an expectation that we have. But as far as the exact number, I, I don't know. I guess I will just note, though, um, you know, several million people um, in the last you know, 20 years have attempted to purchase um, guns through systems where there have been background checks, have been found to be, pro to, to be prohibited, and have been blocked. We have this whole other system where there's no background check. So we know there's going to be some they're trying to buy through here and getting blocked. We want to make sure they get blocked the other method. Representative Grassel. And I guess another question would be, uh, for, from me, uh, who's the database going to keep track of? Whose guns are the database going to keep track of? My guns as a law-abiding citizen? Certainly not the criminals. Represent Pinto. Madam Chair, I mean, I guess the database here is is your own. Uh, hopefully, you keep track of the, the put the records uh, in a, in your own safe. Your, there, there is no there is no database, Representative Grossel. Um, it's it's you keep you keep track of it yourself. If if you and the buyer decide that you uh, don't want to keep the records, then you can do it through the FFL through an FFL. But nothing gets sent into any government entity. And thanks for the chance to clarify that. Final Representative Grossel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And. Reverend Christopher is exactly right. These bills today do nothing to stop the criminal element. They do nothing to stop the criminal element. These bills only hinder and hamstring law-abiding citizens. And I want my members from the other side, first you want to defund the police, then you want to use the police. Can we just come up with, I mean, get on, get on track with one thing, please? We have existing laws. We have existing laws that should be enforced, that should be prosecuted, and should be sentenced to stop this violence. And you're right. You're right, Representative Frazier. It is spread across the state of Minnesota. And on your watch, I'm sorry. But it has gotten so much worse. Representative Grossel, we are discussing the bill right yes, now. We are going to move on. The next uh, person on the list is Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Grossel stole my thunder a little bit. I'll keep my point very, very brief um, because I'm going to have further opportunity to make it. Um, and it's already been made by Thomas Gallagher and Reverend Tim Christopher and, and other testifiers that there's a theme to these bills that we're being presented with here today. Um, and that theme is life is going to get more difficult for a certain class of people in the state of Minnesota. And it's not the people who are out there raping and killing and assaulting and committing crimes. Life is going to get more difficult for the people who are just trying to live their lives as responsible gun owners. 
and go about their day-to-day -day business. The, these bills set traps for, for people who are not criminals but want to be able to protect themselves and engage in their Second Amendment rights. Please vote no. Representative Nabati. Thank you, Chair Moeller. And uh, speaking last, you get to wrap up after everybody's uh, made some very good points. I will briefly say I, I didn't think four months ago that I would be on the side of ACLU. I think they're a very persuasive letter and uh, find myself on, on their side on this issue. I'd like to address briefly the, the statistic that Representative Feist brought up about suicides and we're gonna solve a problem that I've seen many, many times in my career. And I think of the times that I've seen some of the most unusual ways that people have committed suicide. And I cannot think of one suicide in my 30 year career that this bill would have changed. There's the underlying problem that everything we're discussing, every result that we have is a result of things that would have been illegal anyway. We have a violence problem in this society. We have a violence problem and it's easy to point at one thing and blame that one thing because it's hard to point at certain groups and say, or individuals and say, this is you, you're the problem. That's uncomfortable, I get it. Um, I, I go back, touching on, on what Reverend Christopher said, the only reason I went with him is because he asked and it was a good situation that I felt that we need to go and try to solve. Um, the, the situation that we were there at, at Winter Gas was, was terrible. Um, none, of, none of these bills, none of these bills today solve anything that is the situation that we are working on. We have a violence problem. Last night I talked about the, the domestic abuse victims that died in the last year and the things downstairs. I, I read about beatings, I read about chokings. It's a violence problem to point at one thing and say that's it. I, I think it's, it's convenient for some people. I vote no, I recommend a no. Thank you, Chair. Before we get to closing comments, I'd just like to note that we are doing all of the things. None of us are saying that any one of these bills, or even collectively, these bills are going to solve the problem. We have in this committee, we've worked on catalytic theft converters. We've worked on carjacking. We've worked on labor trafficking. We've worked on uh, sexual assault invasion of privacy cases. We've talked about mm -hmm. violence prevention funding, giving funding to our BCA to help our local communities that are struggling with increases in crime. I looked at the data regarding sentencing, and do you want to know what county was, what's the worst county as far as mandatory minimums when a firearm established? It was Wright County. We're going to be looking at that data together. We're going to be talking about prosecuting these cases. We're going to talk, be talking about how these cases are sentencing. We're going to do all of these things. These are not either or scenarios. Further uh, closing comments, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, members, for the discussion. Um, I think we have a, uh, there's a basic maybe category error uh, situation between um, you know, where we're talking past each other. The idea is um, uh, responsible gun owners, as I said before, um, they don't want to have their guns mm -hmm. end up in the hands of somebody who's a dangerous felon. Um, uh, and what I've talked um, with, uh, with members of the Republican, the Republican caucus uh, over time, a number of times they said, look, um, yeah, you know, we, we don't want to have that happen. And, and folks, there should be responsibility for where you're going to end, ends up going. The thing is, you have to have a background check in order to be able to do that. This is a bill um, that is so reasonable. Um, it is supported, as Rep. Grousel alluded to, by our police chiefs, by our sheriffs, by our county attorneys, by the um, frontline police officers and the MPPOA. Um, long guns are excluded. Um, there is not a record sent into government. This is something, members, that is keeping uh, folks safe in other states, and it is time for Minnesota to do the same. Uh, Madam Chair, members, please vote yes. 
Representative Pinto renews his motion that House File 14, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. A roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Moeller? Aye. Moeller, yes. Vice Chair Feist? Aye. Feist, yes. Representative Novotny? No. Novotny, no. Representative Becker-Finn? Aye. Becker Finn, yes. Representative Curran? Aye. Curran, yes. Representative Ingen? No. Ingen, no. Representative Fraser? Yes. Fraser, yes. Representative Grussell? No. Nope. Grussell, no. Representative Hollins? Yes. Hollins, yes. Representative Hudson? No. Nope. Hudson, no. Representative Hewitt? Aye. Hewitt, yes. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes no. Mueller, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, yes. Representative Tapke? Aye. Tapke, yes. Representative Witte? No. Witte, no. There being nine ayes and six nays, that concludes the roll call vote. There being nine ayes and six nays, the motion prevails.